Hello and welcome back to the Cloyster Bell podcast hosted by Rob and Liam. In this podcast we will be discussing my favourite William Hartnell story. Hi everyone and welcome back, hope you're all well. I'm Liam and I'm joined as ever, of course, by Rob. Hi Rob. Hi, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> good, good. How's it going? Good, fine, thanks. Um, just life is normal in lockdown. <laughs> yep, yeah. so, have you been up to much? Uh, no. <laughs> How odd. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think that's the thing. It's when lockdown gets lifted, whenever that will be, Um, because my thing was, well, I want to be out that door meeting as many people as possible, you know, uh, and probably just gabbling away at nine to the dozen, but I was thinking, well, actually, the the realities will probably be, I'll have to give it a couple of months to get a life back, so when I do meet people, I have something to talk about. Yes, everyone's going to be like, how was lockdown? (laughs) Well, you know, the usual, probably the same for you, how was it for you? Yeah, the usual, didn't really leave the house much. We're all going to look like we've just emerged from a cave, <laughs> looking like Tom Hanks in Castaway. <laughs> oh, should we just call everyone Wilson and just make it easier on ourselves? <laughs> Wilson! <laughs> Wilson! <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun when it happens, I'm looking forward to it, although cause Lord knows when the, yeah. <laughs> when life will get back to normal. I all... know. At, at work at the moment, every few minutes an announcement plays. Just reminding everyone to be safe and respect each other. And um, one of my work colleagues turned to me today and says, that's that guy from um, Little Britain. I went, who? So you know the narrator. <laughs> well, what, Tom, Tom Baker. Tom Baker. <laughs> I wish Tom Baker was doing the tan I don't wish. So Tom Baker's telling everyone to be safe. I suppose if it was Tom Baker, it would feel a bit less dictatorial. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> but the way you just describe it, just, yeah. Be safe. Be vigilant. It's a bit safe. Oh God, I don't want to read 1984. As a bit, you know, it should it should remain as fiction. Anyway, <laughs> well, glad you're safe and well, trapped in the house, as are we all. Um, exciting times, people. Uh, but it gives us plenty of time to um, <laughs> watch Doctor Who. Um, it's quite funny. So. Um, in our previous podcast, we discussed Rob's favourite Hartnell story, which was the Aztecs, a uh, story we yep. both absolutely love. Uh, and for my Hartnell story, we stick with the historicals, as my favourite is the Crusade, uh, which is a four-part adventure with only episodes one and three still, avail- still available in the archives. Um, uh, but before I give a brief overview on why some episodes of Doctor Who are not available to view, it's it's been quite interesting that... Um, for the first time ever, we have a podcast where there was no listeners' responses whatsoever. No. No. So my favourite Hartnell story is a story that no one gives a flying toss about. No one's seen it. <laughs> <I'll be. laughs> oh, it's just, you know, great. Um, <laughs> so I don't know what that says about you, dear listener, or, or my questionable taste. But anyway... Um, So the reason why we only have half the story to watch is the culture of television in the 1960s is different to the culture of television today. The attitudes of yesteryear have completely changed. And it's only with now the benefit of hindsight we recognise the BBC's decision to wipe material during the 70s as the mistake it was. The BBC had been broadcasting since before the Second World War, but once the war was over, television became a central part of British life in the following decade. Um... 1959 was the first time the medium of television was utilised in Britain for the general election. Broadcasts had always been done live, yet uh, 1958 saw a a huge leap. Uh, That was the first time a programme had been recorded in advance of transmission, and within two or three years that would become the standard practice, with live broadcasts being phased out. And it was common for programmes to be recorded weeks in advance of transmission. As I said before, that was a huge breakthrough. But 
what, but videotape was seen as nothing more than a commodity which was needed to broadcast programs. So of course what this meant that once a program had been shown, uh, the job of the videotape it had been recorded on was complete. Uh, the, so therefore the BBC found they had an increasing number of large, bulky and expensive videotapes to store and look after. Now each two inch tape was about the size of a car tyre and was expensive. It cost the equivalent of three months wages for the average British worker. So the obvious solution was to reuse them and so stories were wiped. In some cases the wiping of stories did not happen straight away. Um, some were deemed popular enough to make money by selling them overseas. Doctor Who was one such programme. However, the sales potential could only be exploited up to a certain point, and once that had been done, the video could then be reused. On top of that, uh, the Actors' Union at the time also stated repeats were detrimental to actors as it could lose them work, and so when things were repeated, which was very rare, it was only of programmes that were a maximum of two years old. And only after a hefty new payment was made to the actors and freelancers concerned in making that particular program. Uh, that changed by 1974, but by that stage, colour television was now the norm, and so the interest in old black and white broadcasts had waned dramatically. So, taking into account home entertainment was a number of years away, it's hardly surprising certain stories were wiped. It's only now we see what a mistake it was to permanently wipe stories. Um, as time's gone on, we've been fortunate enough to, you know, some stories have, despite all odds, seem to have been found. Uh, you know, we, the, the biggest, in terms of Doctor Who, you know, a few years back, we had um, most of the weather fear found in all of uh, the enemy of the world, which were Patrick Troughton stories, which had been missing from the archives. So that's just to give you a, a bit of a history of why, in this case, we can't, we can't watch all of the crusade. Uh, I hope that wasn't boring for everyone. Are you still awake, Rob? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just Very <about>. interesting. <laughs> Just about. Right, okay. So I'm going to continue waffling on for a bit. So sorry about this. So now it's the plot synopsis. So as I said, the Crusade is my favourite Hartnell story. So the TARDIS arrives during the Third Crusade, a holy war between King Richard the Lionheart and the Sac uh, Saracen ruler Saladin. Having got caught up in a Saracen ambush, during which Barbara is abducted by the attackers, the Doctor, Ian and Vicky are welcomed at King Richard's palace in the nearby port city of Jaff uh, Jaffar. Ian is granted permission to ride off in search of Barbara as an official emissary, the King knighting him Sir Ian of Jaffa to fit him in the role, while the Doctor and Vicky stay behind and try to avoid getting involved in court intrigue. King Richard secretly plans to arrange a marriage between his sister Joanna and Saladin's brother Safadin, in the hope of ending the war. When Joanna finds out about it, though, she refuses point blank. The Doctor and Vicky flee the palace after making an enemy of the King's advisor, the Earl of Leicester. Eventually, they reach the wood where the TARDIS materialised. Ian is already waiting there, with Barbara having rescued her from the savage, uh, savage clutches of the Saracen Emma Alkir. However, the travellers escape is almost thwarted by the Earl of Leicester. Fortunately, they manage to regain the safety of the ship by means of a ruse, the soldiers believing that the brave Sir Ian has been spirited away by sorcerers. So that's just a, a brief, uh, brief synopsis of the entire story. So, cast and crew. Uh, this was the first credited Doctor Who story to be fully directed by Douglas Canfield. It was written by David Whittaker, produced by Verity Lambert, music by Dudley Simpson. Uh, William Hartnell played the Doctor, William Russell Ian Chesterton, Jacqueline Hill, Barbara Wright, Maureen O'Brien played Vicky, Julian Glover, Richard the Lionheart, John Bay, Earl of Leicester, G. Marsh, Joanna, Walter Randall, El Akir, John Flint, William de Preo, Roger Avon, Safadine, Bernard Kay, Saladin. I love that. There's a guy called Bernard who plays Saladin. Anyway, uh, Reg Pritchard <laughs> plays Ben de Heer. Um, so now we've got that out of the way and me rambling and hopefully everyone's still awake um what what are your first memories of this story rob my first memories i was aware of it um i possibly had seen the existence of a novelization and i'd seen it was on bbc cd at the time i think and um, but my first experience was the dvd ah right okay why is it your favorite story and what's your first experience well, my first experience goes back to um, the Hartnell years. So during the 90s, we had a series of videos which were uh, 
because this was pre-DVDs and special features and all the rest of it, so and pre-internet. So any clips of old Doctor Who or these, you know, the remains of missing stories were were gold dust. So we had this thing called the Hartnell Years, which was presented by Sylvester McCoy looking at, as the title suggests, the Hartnell Years. And on that video was, at that point, the only remaining episode of the Crusade, which was episode three, The Wheel of Fortune. Um, and as a kid, I, I wouldn't have said at the time when I was a kid it was my favourite Hartnell story. As I said, I was only aware of that one episode. And I liked it, but... Um, you know, I thought the one episode of the Celestial Toy Maker was a bit more interesting, um, and of course, you could see stories like the Aztecs, which reviewed pre- uh, in our previous podcast, which is your favourite Hartnell story, and it's certainly one of my all-time favourites. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. So I would probably have cited that as my favourite. But as time's gone on, um, I've become much more aware of the story and the fact that in 1999, episode one, The Lion, was discovered. It had been discovered in New Zealand. Um, so now that so now that we had episodes one and three, they were then made available on VHS box set with the Space Museum, uh, and linking material was provided by William Russell. And William Russell was uh, effectively playing Ian Chesterton again after all those years, which was I thought pretty cool. And that's you know, and we can see that on the Lost on Time DVD. Uh, ah, so those segments with William Russell, they are from the VHS? Yeah, from yeah. The Time that, Museum set. Yeah, yeah, that's right, ah, yeah. okay. Um, Interesting. So, th- yeah, that was great. So because I no longer have the VHS box set, now that we've got the, um, you know, I thought that was lost. I completely forgot that the, the linking material was, was uh, still provided on the Lost on Time DVD. So when we reviewed this, um, I was quite pleased that was still there. To answer your question, a few years back, well, quite a few years back now, uh, I did that thing which all Doctor Who fans attempt at some point, which is, I'll watch all the Doctor Who stories in order. And uh, when it came to the the William Hartnell era, which is a, a period of Doctor Who I absolutely love, this story leapt out a lot more. And I think because um, being an adult, because I think this is Doctor Who is a, a straightforward, very well-told drama, it just appealed a lot more. So what you're saying is that was it was so was this the first time you'd seen um, episode one, the lion? Well, I totally forgot about Wheel of Fortune on um, the Hartnell years. Obviously, I would have seen that numerous times and mm. just forgotten about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ob- obviously, it wasn't as memorable, like you said, as the the Celestial Toy Maker episode. But yet, yeah, something that just fell out of memory, and obviously, I'd watched it on the DVD. Um, when maybe 15 or more years ago when it came out mm-hmm. and then it just fell out of memory yeah I mean it's hardly surprising because I think I mean the fact that as I said before we have had no listeners responses whatsoever despite uh, repeated appeals on, on our social media what do you think of the crusade oh, I haven't heard a thing um, either it's a story that well really I think it's a story that not many people um, are particularly aware of and I think uh, the fact that we can only watch two of the four episodes and you know when you've got things like as i said you know the aztecs you know you've got an unearthly child we have uh the daleks the daleks invasion of earth you know important stories and people that i think those are the stories that would immediately spring to mind so i think probably a lot of people have gone why on earth would you pick the crusade but i genuinely love it um yeah uh in terms of the hartnell era um which i adore uh I tend to say I, t- I tend to prefer the historical stories more than the science fiction ones. That isn't to say that I don't enjoy the science fiction ones, but in terms of quality, I find that the historical adventures are much better written, much better realised, and I just find a bit more gripping. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the drama tends to be a bit more mature. And being older, I tend to appreciate that a lot more. And for me, the Crusade is the uh, is is the peak of that. Um, I just think it's uh, it's incredibly well written. Uh, so in the first episode, um, where we the are lion, yes, the lion, um, we are introduced pretty much uh, in one fell swoop all the key players. So we have Richard the Lionheart. He, you know, he's clearly a bit weary from having continued to fight the Crusade, but he's 
um, spending some much needed time relaxing and playing game in a forest with some of his knights um, but they are about to be ambushed by the Saracen um, and the TARDIS crew land in the middle of all this and a, and a fight breaks out um, what did you think of the fight? with Ian mm. well he's kind of the action man at the time I guess yes yeah, he is yeah it's uh you, ha- you do have to suspend your disbelief I guess with um clearly choreographed safe fights I don't know I didn't really um analyze it much further than that no no, no that's fine I was uh, I was it was just curious I think yeah you you know you're watching it and you're aware that you are watching television from the early 1960s um and I think the fight was reasonably well choreographed but in terms of modern viewers I think they would expect something a bit more uh, a bit more pacey and probably a little bit better executed but nonetheless I still think it's it's quite well done and I think uh, Douglas Canfield's direction is really rather good there's an awful lot of aerial shots you know shots from above um, yes from above the fight yeah yeah which uh, I think is actually quite impressive and there are some fast cuts um, there's a bit when uh, you know th- it looks like Ian's about to head his, have his head lopped off, but he quickly moves his head in time um, when he's on yes. the floor. Uh, you know, which is uh, I think quite quite good. And as I said uh, in, in my introduction, you know, videotape was very expensive, um, and what that also meant was that when you were recording, um, I think I remember rightly that in ter- they were only allowed three cuts uh, on for the videotape when they were e- when it came to editing it because it was jolly expensive okay. so the fact that you've got some of this um some of this edited and it's it's quite impressive i think you know it holds up but given the time i think it's it's even more impressive and when you've got this fight going on you've got william hartnell um sort of injecting <laughs> injecting this moment with with some humor mm. uh you know just dis- dis- distracting one of the saracen by you know by sort of <laughs> popping up from a bush and going hello there <laughs> in quite a camp way um, and then Ian is able to step in and, and, and complete it all but during all of this um, Barbara is kidnapped and that's what um, provides the main reason for the TARDIS crew to, to remain here they've, they've now got to find Barbara uh, there's a lot of real danger in this story yeah. th- yes th- there is an awful lot and it, it, from from it's there from from the beginning, but now that Barbara is kidnapped and her life is in danger, which I'll I'll discuss uh, a little bit later. Uh, but now, the rest of the TARDIS crew have a very difficult uh, task, which is they've now got to blend into the time period um, and make friends with Richard, King Richard, uh, in order for them to to help find Barbara. And one of the one of the ways that they do this, we see. Um, the the doctor and Vicky find, try and find some clothes, and uh, they they do this by coming across I think which is probably the story's comic element, and probably the only real comic element, um, which given the danger as you said before is you know is is, is much needed this this humour which is um, the the salesman, um, you know trying to drum up um, drum up sales. And not being very yes. successful, and then of course you know, and then the Doctor comes along, and there's just some nice camaraderie between these two characters, and of course the um, the Doctor concocts concocts this thing uh, to steal the clothes, but finds out that the clothes were already stolen in the first place. So it's quite interesting. He, you know, we, yeah, we... he almost justifies stealing them that way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 But two wrongs don't make a right, so we see the Doctor become no. a thief. Um, but you can understand a, a bit of a vandal as well. <laughs> yes, he just he pull, <laughs> pulls the table leg over. Or something. Yeah, yeah, and all the clothes fall onto the floor, and then the salesman is absolutely into the destroyed. Mud, yeah. yeah, it's just felt bad for him. <laughs> I did, but it is a, it is a really nice, uh, charming scene. It's, it's, it's a memorable scene. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, it made me smile. It's very well written, very well played, and it is is, is quite charming. Um. And so that what then happens is we then cut between um, Barbara's situation and the Doctor Vicky's and Ian's situation. And uh, what's quite interesting with the Crusade is the difference between Saladin and Richard. 
uh, how they're portrayed and I think it's quite even-handed and, uh, and very interesting um, the Doctor Vicky and Ian are you know caught up in court intrigue and they have to be on the good side of Richard um, who can fly off the handle uh, you know some moments he can be quite you know reassuring and listening and then he's you know very stubborn and like a child in many in many instances and you're dealing with a, with a personality which can go from one extreme to the other you know you can mm. he can flip quite easily and so that's the danger that they're in it's similar to what we were talking about in the aztecs when um it did show these different aspects of the civilization and defied kind of your perception of them you know you didn't brand them with a a single um kind of way of life they weren't they were, they were very civilized they were also very barbaric and then we've got these two perceptions of richard and saladin yeah and that sometimes that can defy your expectations i think yes. the way they're portrayed do you think yeah yeah uh, very much so and I think, yeah i think that comparison with the aztecs is a good one um so, yeah uh so as i said you've got you know richard and you know he can go from one extreme to the other but you've got saladin who's very um cautious and very calculating and I think one of the most chilling scenes in this entire story is um, there's a conversation uh, taking place between Saladin and Barbara. And um, Saladin is basically saying to Barbara, I need to consider what to do with you. You know, you're here um, dur- you know, during this, this holy war. Um, I've got to really consider what I do with you. Do I let you go? Or, you know, do I... Do I get rid of you or what and barbara says um oh i don't think you're as calculating as that because the conversation seems to have been a bit sort of cordial and um uh, and again it's, it's it's quite interesting you know barbara has convinced saladin that she is a traveling storyteller and she makes references to previous adventures like the romans and the web planet these these nice little references if you're aware of the previous adventures yeah. um it's also a strange thing to say you know she's She's quite an intelligent person. Mm-hmm. Why? Why would you think that these would sound like rational words? Yes, to but say to somebody. Yeah, um, but you know, she's she's putting across well, she, well, you know, I provide entertainment <laughs> through stories, which makes sense of the period. Um, you know, so the conversation seems to be a bit cordial and quite nice. And she says, "I don't think you're as calculating as all that." And Saladin goes, "Well, think again." Uh, either you you serve my purpose or you serve no purpose, and you go, oh, you know, he's you know he's being upfront about about this, and you're starting to get a sense of the danger that that Barbara is really in. But the bit that's mm-hmm. really chilling is is towards the end of this conversation, which is um, you know um, Saladin basically says, you know, uh, if you provide you know, if you're a storyteller, entertain us, tell us stories, and Barbara makes reference quite innocently to Shahrazad and the tale of you know the Arabian Nights um mm. you know thinking it's quite a cool reference to drop and then Saladin points out that uh, Shahrazad had to tell those stories under sentence of death uh if she didn't entertain then she would be killed that was her purpose and right. i think uh i think that's, I think that's a very intelligent, dramatic way to impart the danger that that Barbara is in. I suppose you have to be a little bit of aware of the, the tales of Shahrazad, but having said that, Sal- Saladin in his his line of dialogue does say, and you know, like the tales of Shahrazad is what Barbara says, and then he says, under whom hung sentence of death. I just think that's a really, really well played, well written scene, and you really, you know, get a sense of of the danger that Barbara's in. Um, mm-hmm. I like that an awful lot, uh, and that's 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 a scene that always sort of sticks in my mind. In fact, there's quite a few stories in the Hartnell era which um, do place Barbara in quite um, uh, dangerous situations. There's, um, if you're familiar with a story story Marco Polo, the the the. I think it's in episode four. I'm not too, I'm not too sure. I can't quite remember. But uh, there's a bit in that story where um, she's been kidnapped and her kidnappers are playing dice 
over whether she dies or not. So her hands are purely in the game of chance. Uh, you know, we discussed the danger she's in in the Aztecs. There's a bit in the Keys of Marinus where um, Ian has been tricked to to leave, and she's left in the room with this this huntsman who clearly. You know, I think if you're a child watching it, it's 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 just made. You know, he 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 doesn't mean her well, and he's a nasty piece of work. But I think as a, as a, as an older viewer, you clearly wants to rape Barbara. It's uh, you know, that's that's really bloody dark. Um, mm. And is, is it Barbara that's threatened by Susan in Edge of Destruction with the scissors? Oh, I can't remember. Possibly. Um, I mm. think so. I, I can't quite remember if it's Barbara or Ian. And my my memory is it's Barbara, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But yeah, there's uh, this, you know, the series does place Barbara in um in a, a lot of very dangerous situations, um, but it's it's balanced with you know Barbara's intelligence and you know she's capable of getting out the situation, but it's whether you know she will or not. But it's um mm. I just thought it's just point those out. But um yeah, I thought I thought that moment in episode one pinpointing the danger she's in and it doesn't let up because um she ends up making an enemy of el akir made him to look like a fool and in fact because earlier on in the episode there's some again brilliant lines of dialogue where um when they're talking about is it el akir's talking about um punishing barbara yes by making her that sounds like the punishment for a fool like a fool yeah. yes yeah yeah that's yeah. it uh and then Saladin's response is indeed it does and who here has been the most foolish looking at El here. it's brilliant uh, yeah it's again it's it's brilliant and this is one of the other reasons why I love the crusade it's it's the dialogue I think it's fantastic it's 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 really something special David Whitaker has written this story superbly well it's got just great lines of dialogue and very memorable and you know we're, we're quoting mo you know we're we're quoting quite uh, quite a bit of it. So yeah, Al Akia is made to look like a fool and therefore has it in for Barbara. Um, mm-hmm. And that really becomes the main threat for episode two. Um, you know, where she's, she has to escape from him. Um, yes. Whilst uh, Ian is on the lookout. He, you know, he, he's now left. He's now been knighted. He's now an emissary. Uh, trying, to, And the idea is he will go to Saladin's camp and... Um, try and bargain the return of Barbara um, now episode 2 is the first episode of the story that we can't watch it exists only in audio um, so this might be a bit of a tricky question uh, what were the highlights in this episode for you oh is it in part 2 where the merchant comes in and um, it's the whole situation with the clothes oh yes yeah yeah that's right yeah and the doctor kind of turns that around doesn't he Yes, yeah, yeah. That's quite that, again. That that's a nice moment of levity. So the um, so the 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 Chamberlain is aware that the 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 clothes that the Doctor and Vicky are wearing have been stolen, so believes they have stolen them. But um, the the salesman from the first episode, uh, is has been supplying um, the, the the fort that they are in with the clothes as well as stealing from them as well <laughs> so the you have this comical conversation where you have the salesman who is uh saying that the, the doctor has stolen the clothes from him but the but then the doctor's pointing out but the clothes were stolen from the chamberlain from this very place um but the fact that the doctor stole them in the first place you know it, it is this absolute but yeah you're right i think this is probably a nice little highlight of the episode this is sort of like this comedy of errors playing out and the doctor manages to not only talk himself out of the out of the problem, but also the salesman out of the problem as well. <laughs> it's quite, yeah, that is a nice moment. And I think that's it's probably one of the things because William Hartnell was very good at comedy. He was a very good straight actor, did drama very very well. But you know, you can see it even in moments in, in Doctor Who stories. You know, he does comedy very well, and. If for this scene alone, I would love episode, you know, for us to be able yes. to watch episode two and just, um, just see how William Hartnell would have performed it, because um, it'd probably yeah. be even more funnier. But yeah, oh, well, of course, I did like the opening scene because in the cliffhanger for part one, um, King Richard was determined that he was he would not help them rescue Barbara. Yes, yeah, yeah, and 
then they devised this situation in his mind that um, Saladin has um, Depreo believing him to be King Richard and they convince, they convince Richard that um, he should go and um, make him look like the fool because he hasn't captured him. Yes. Yeah. I like how they just swayed his opinion just like that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of like, you know a, a lot of manipulation uh, going on uh, and sort of political intrigue from from that side of things, and it's uh, it holds up very well. It doesn't feel forced or contrived. You know, I, I mean, I don't know about you, Rob, but you know, when I was watching the story and then listening to these bits, I wasn't thinking that's pushing it a bit. I don't think the king, you know, to say the king was convinced by that's pushing it. No, I thought it was very convincing. I thought it was quite good. But yeah, I would say, you know, so that's the, the main thing of, of, of episode two. Um, and then episode three, The Wheel of Fortune, finally an episode we can now watch. And the last one that we can watch from this story. Uh, Barbara has managed to escape from El Akir, but um, obviously her, her life's in danger. You know, she, she has to go into hiding. And uh, she ends up befriending... Um, uh, a citizen of uh, Jaffa, and you get a sort of this really—it's wonderful in sense of the storytelling, but this really tragic, um, very tragic, yeah, very yeah. very tragic family affair that 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 they get introduced into the story. Um, so, because uh, I don't want to, I don't want to waffle on too much. Do you do you want to discuss that? So yes, I can't remember this character's name, but um, he's explained to Barbara that um, is it Alakir himself that was responsible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, for his um, for his family's death, and of course he says that he's told his daughter that they are alive and well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, and so Barbara has to. She now has this burden of looking after his daughter. Not only that, he leaves Barbara with his knife mm-hmm. to take his daughter's life. Yeah, um, if it, need be. Yeah, it's so you this know this massive burden on Barbara. It's, of course, we know she should never do that. No, no, she um, doesn't. But, but I of mean, course, there could be a face worse worse than death awaiting his daughter. Yeah. Um, so you know, we have the remains of this family. You know, the, the you know uh, his his wife and his daughter's mother. You know killed disappeared brothers and sisters so all what remain are the, the, these two people and this was all because of the fault of El Akir um, you know and, and Barbara's informed of this um, you know and it, it's 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 a brilliant again it's it's a very emotional scene you know because you know she's very grateful because you know she has this 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 brief moment of safety because she's in hiding but she's aware that her presence is making it even more difficult um for, for, for this man who's taken it upon her upon himself to 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 rescue Barbara, um, mm. but yeah, he goes out to make sure the coast is clear for her to uh, continue her escape. Um, yeah, and leaves the knife. And then when he's confronted out in the street, he reaches for his knife and he doesn't have it, unfortunately. Yeah. So he's captured. Mm. Yeah. So 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 he's captured, um, and. His his daughter and Barbara are now in this this cubby hole hiding, and they're about to because the, the guards are aware that someone's around, but they can't you know can't find them. So they uh, they do, they they devise this plan to basically set the house on fire. So either they will burn to death, or it, or the smoke will smoke them out. And Barbara, you know, makes sure that the the daughter's safe, and then makes her you know tries to make her escape. But she's caught and captured. And I remember for, yes. for, for many, many years, um, because I wasn't aware of, of the, the audio that existed in, in the fourth episode, which obviously we'll, we'll go on to discuss. But for many years, I thought that what happened was the father was kidnapped and probably killed. And all what remained was the daughter all alone on her set. And, th- and that was it. And I'm, That's awful because you feel so bad for it, don't you? Um, initially, mm-hmm. be ashamed for it to lose, it, lose him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so th- that's what I honestly thought that, that happened, and it was just absolutely tragic. There's a, there's a bit of a happy ending 
um, thank goodness in the, in the fourth episode but but nonetheless at, at this moment when you're watching the story that's what the, the, the stakes are um, mm. you know, and that scene where Barbara trying to escape that's a bit tense isn't it yeah. when she's hiding behind the bollard and she sneaks off and gets caught yeah, so you know she's trying to. Do, it's sort of this because there's a guard remaining in the house, and she, you know, she has to sort of maneuver herself around. And you think maybe she's just about, you know, be able to get it, but then the other guard comes with a torch. Did seem that way. Mm. Yeah. Um, shame. But again, again, it's yeah, yeah, it is a dying shame. But again, it's it, you know that that's it's it's really good drama and told very well. And in fact, this episode when I was watching it again for the purposes of this podcast. Um, I was just thinking because, you know, we're we're introduced to this this family drama and and this real emotional connection that Barbara has with these two people who are now helping and feeding her, and you get a real sense of, you get a real sense of uh, ordinary people getting caught up in this war, uh, ordinary people's lives and how they're devastated by 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 the war and by tyrants and you know other people's awful actions, and within the space of four episodes. And it's paced very well. It doesn't feel rushed. It doesn't feel too slow paced. I think the Crusaders is a, is a, is a brilliantly paced story. Um, but I, I realised I went actually what you've got here are a lot of ingredients which would um, in a in a modern television series would easily unfold over thirteen episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which is you know understandable. You know, you you get a you know for thirteen episode series which we're familiar with now. You. Um, you know, it does provide you with extra scope to, to, to look at situations from different angles. But here we have um, a television series from the early 1960s, which managed to do that with great economy, but do it very well. Because as I said, it, it didn't feel rushed or anything. You've got all these ingredients for fantastic mm. storytelling. and um, told. It had much greater scope. It doesn't deal much with the crusade itself. Mm. Um, it doesn't tackle the issue of um, heresy from anyone's perspective. Yeah. So yes, there could could have could have been a lot more there if it had been a, a much richer story, like a ten part story. That would have been pretty good. Yes, that's true. But what it does do, uh, having said that, because I agree with you uh, from that side of things, but what it does do is it deals with the difference between the two leaders, Saladin and Richard, and how they're trying to deal with the war and how they're weary of it and trying to broker peace. Um, yeah. uh, but then it also looks at you know the the the, the ordinary people caught up in it, caught up in the situation. It's sort of um, that's what the story focuses on and, and does really well. Even on either side, it focuses on the individual people, and it's not just rational decisions. It's dealing with their own kind of ego and um, and their and their own pride. Yeah. Yes, very yes, uh, very much so. And in fact, because it's 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 also in this episode, uh, Joanna. Uh, finds out that her brother, the king, uh, had come up with this idea of marrying her to um, Safadin, Saladin's brother, as a means yes. of breaking peace, uh, making peace. And um, she's not keen on this idea at all, is she? No, not at all. No. Um, so, you know, quite understandably, you know, to, and again, I thought this was this was. Again, brilliant, brilliant drama played superbly well by Gene Marsh and uh, Julian Glover, and again, you know, very well written, and you know, the, you get the real sense of of, of the power uh, and this the, and the power struggles and the, this the, the, this idea and why Joanna would find the idea absolutely repulsive, and it's it's this great moment of, um, you know, when you know when she says you cannot demand this of me and he goes cannot as if he's some kind of petulant child um and he goes no there's a greater power and he goes i am the king who has greater power than me and then she says the pope his holiness the pope in rome will not allow this marriage to that infidel just sorry just the, just the way she uh, enunciates that word it's a brilliant brilliant scene and you know you you, you do get sense of, you know it Again, in a, in a few lines of dialogue between uh, the drama between these two characters, you get um, you, you you're also given a sense of um, the world during the Third Crusade, the reason why they're there, and you know how the king was in a powerful position, but in in this instance, you know the the Pope 
was in a much powerful position and he's not even there you get a, so again it's it's david whittaker telling an awful lot within um within just a few lines of dialogue um again i i just think it's fantastic and then um and then once again you know and, and again we have a great cliffhanger in this episode i think probably the, for me the, the the best cliffhanger uh in this story you know barbara's been kidnapped by el akia again uh and he's very calm and all what he says is um i'm going to see if i can get the line right um De it's so oh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact line of dialogue and it's bugging me because i know it is in there it's but he's basically says you know uh, death is the only comfort you will have and death is very far away it's much better written than that that's kind of the gist of the line and then mm -hmm. and then you just and then you just close on barbara's reaction to that uh and jacqueline hill plays that part really well you know she's it's that wonderful mix of defiance and bravery of wanting to get out of the situation but also you get the sense of hopelessness because at that moment it doesn't look like Barbara's going to get out of this situation at all. No. No, it's no wonder the guy wanted Barbara to, um, to kill his daughter. Mm. If that's the case, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then finally you know, we come to the, 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 the fourth episode and because I think... I mean, I love The Lion, I love The Wheel of Fortune in terms of the episodes that we can watch, but I think probably The Wheel of Fortune of the of of the two we can watch is my favourite. So the fact it ends on that that brilliant cliffhanger and the fact that you can't follow it up by watching yeah. it um, does frustrate well, I think, me. I think it says um, the only pleasure she has left is death. And death is that very is. far away. Yes, that's it. That's yeah. the line, Rob. But of course, she does escape um, in the in the fourth episode. Um, so El Akia, it sounds comic, but when when you actually hear the episode, it, it, it does it does sound like it was it, it, it was performed quite well. But basically, El mm. Akia turns to his guards and congratulates them for for kidnapping Barbara. And when he's doing that, she sneaks off. Um, it sounds comic, but again, when you're hearing the performances, it's it sounds um, it actually sounds quite good. Um, and uh, she ends up hiding in his harem. Episode four, you know, really, really picks up the pace. Uh, even though you know you were just listening to the audio with with no um, uh, with no descriptions, with, with no descriptions, anything like that. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't bored. I didn't struggle to visualize. And the twenty five minutes really sort of goes a quite a good lick. Um, I don't know whether you thought the same or not. Yeah, it flowed pretty well. I quite like listening to it. Yeah, and uh, it almost feels like it's on the verge of becoming a sort of Errol Flynn swashbuckling adventure. Um, uh, and we also have some some nice uh, happy endings. So it turns out that um, the, the the father from the previous episode uh, has managed yes. to escape and is fine and dandy and is able to rescue his daughter. And it turns out that actually not all the family were were killed some of them are, you know i think it's is it the mother or the sister who's in the harem uh the, the sister the yeah. sister that yes so they're reunited with a family member they thought was lost so there's you know it's still sad that you know the mother and other family members were were brutally killed but you know th these two people whom um barbara related to and we the audience do it's nice that they're reunited and they're fine and actually they were united with another family member that, that that's quite nice um mm -hmm. and then uh and then ian arrives on the scene and comes to rescue barbara and you can just i think if it, you can almost imagine him sort of like um swashbuckling his way through grabbing barbara and yes. then diving out through the window onto a horse and then galloping away i mean that doesn't happen but you can almost imagine you know the it's sort of that's the sort of the, the pace and the, the sense of action that you get with the drama, and I think it's it's quite good. But um, so yeah. Ian and Barbara are now out of danger. They they've escaped, but now the danger is with the Doctor and Vicky because they got caught up in court intrigue and made uh, an enemy of the Earl of Leicester. And and this was something that that I missed uh, when we were discussing the first episode. That that's my fault. But there's a there, there was a brilliant scene when um the earl of leicester you know is is 
is talking to the king and basically going, why aren't we here? You know, why are we here if if not to fight? You know, and the, and the doctor's um, going, you know, this is an opportunity for peace and you do not talk it down. And then the Earl of Leicester um, responds by going, you know, it's all very well with you, you men of eloquence, um, yap, yap, yapping away. But when you've stunned each other with your words, we we the soldiers have to fight it out. It's a fantastic scene. And again, super. And then uh, the king's looking over with quite a lot of intrigue, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's ju- he's just listening to the he's just yeah. listening to the two arguments, and it's superb. It's it's brilliant, and I uh, absolutely love it. And uh, and that sows the seeds between yeah, you because know, the doctor basically calls the earl a, a complete fool, and. Uh, mm. <laughs> Uh, and that's where the animosity comes from, and now it's it's reached its its uh, peak in in the final episode, where the Earl is convinced that the the Doctor is a spy, for for Saladin, mm-hmm. so he's out for the Doctor's blood. So the the, the Richard um, uh, knows that the Doctor isn't a spy, but um, you know he's not going to tee off one of his you know one of the best knights, uh, one of the one of the best uh, people in his army. Um, so it's like I think it's better go. It's best if you, you know you jog on basically, and the doctor yeah. and Vicky go. No problems. We're off. See it. So they toddle off, but then the Earl is is uh, is baying for their blood um, and is about to dispatch them, and then there's this sort of this tense moment as you know they're very close to the TARDIS, um, mm. and Ian has. It's actually Ian who comes to the rescue using his wits, you know, concocting the story that the doctor has betrayed him and killed people he's loved and so it should be it should be he who dispatches the doctor um and the yes, Earl, like this. yeah which is great uh and so the Earl wears the Earl basically goes yep yeah, that's fine and they all nip into the TARDIS and dematerialize um and that's why they think that Sir Ian Chesterton had been spirited away by sorcerers um <laughs> and and that's it. That's that's the end of that's the end of the crusade. Yes, you did. Uh, you did miss an odd bit when Ian's tied up on the floor and um, the ants are going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, jeez, how can we get now, a scene like that? Now I know there's a there's a story behind this um, mm-hmm. where William Russell wasn't there, but he was also very reluctant to even do the scene. Yeah. So th- this was a uh, so. Th- this was a moment in where, uh, when it was originally broadcast, William Russell was in was in pre-filmed inserts because um, he he was on holiday for I think for a fortnight. So when they were pre-filming that scene where he's kidnapped, uh, but where he, um, he's tied up by someone who thinks he's a rich merchant and wants to get his gold, um, and he's going to cover him in honey to to an uh, to an ant's nest, and so the ants will all come along and. and bite him and be quite unpleasant um is this af- this is after the web planet isn't it yes it is yeah um yeah and uh yeah william russell for, for reasons unknown, just making reference to the ants there <laughs> oh yes yeah i got it um for reasons unknown w- william russell wasn't very keen on the idea of being covered in honey so so they they basically got um an extra or stunt man i don't know some some, some other person around and just had close-ups of, I think it's his wrist and his chest which get covered in honey or something. <laughs> very bizarre. <laughs> very, very bizarre. And I think, um, I think it's it's. I mean, it's. I think it's. Again, this is one moment in the story which I think is played for, for comic effect because, again, we can't see the performance, but hearing, um, the man who's playing Ian's captor he did seem to be play- he did seem to be playing it with um, the exaggerated foreigner's voice would you say I can't remember <laughs> I was just I go back go back and have a listen yeah I, I was just aware, sort of aware it was um, I mean it's of the period it is what it is I don't think yes. I don't think it's I don't think it's massively offensive but you know it's I think if people were listening to now you, you would go it's not really politically correct is yes. it yes um I've noticed is it on Britbox now? Um, like Wang Chiang has a warning saying it it contains um, st- racial stereotypes, which may cause offence. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a bit ridiculous to to to, to, 
to warn people that they may be triggered that the attitudes of the 1970s aren't exactly the attitudes of now. Um, no. I mean, you would hope that we've made some sort of progress. Um, yeah. But I mean, we we. But it's quite funny because that's the only moment I didn't I didn't find it so offensive as to feel that it needed trigger warning or something like that. I just thought it was it was worth mentioning, especially because as I said when I was reading the cast and crew, I find it very I find it very funny. You know, we've got an act, brilliant actor, Bernard Kay. In fact, he'd been in uh, Doctor Who a few times. In fact, he was in the Dalek Version of Earth. You know, but you got this actor, Bernard Kay, and he plays Saladin. Um, it almost sounds quite comic. So you, you have got, you know, uh, Caucasian actors uh, playing, uh, you know, playing, um, you know, Saladin and Safadine and Bender here. Um, but, you know, it was of the period and they play the parts well. Um, you know, they're, they're just mm-hmm. playing good performances and they play them respectfully. I don't think it's an issue. I just thought I, I just thought I mentioned it, but... It did seem to be this one, this one moment where you've got um, this guy, not particularly intelligent, so you, you know, but he, he just, the actor does seem to be putting on the um, exaggerated, too much, too much emphasis, yeah, the, it, or... the, the 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 comic in inverted commas uh, foreigner's accent, but in a bit of an ignorant way, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if this is um, going to be on the lineup to get animated. I do hope so, uh, but funny enough, I think because a lot of people are talking about um, the Doctor Who stories being animated, and in fact, um, I read Power of the Daleks. Yes, the been po- reanimated. Th- yes, that's been reanimated. You got Fury from the Deep. That's been reanimated. Uh, there's there's one or two others I think, uh, which I can't quite remember. But funnily enough, someone had. In fact, I think it was mentioned in a recent issue of Doctor Who magazine where they were talking about this, and someone had said that. Um, Someone made the point that there are only two episodes of the Crusade that would need to be animated. So that's 45 minutes worth of animation that'd be needed, and that'd be quite straightforward. But actually, if you look at uh, the the sets, the costumes, and the number of characters that they would actually need to animate, the, the work yeah. required is actually quite a lot. Logistically, the stories work better when they, they only need, like, so many virtual sets that they can reuse and same characters I'd imagine yeah yeah so the uh, so the faceless ones uh, when they animated that and of course the the power of the Daleks and the others they've had uh, they were relatively easy to animate in the sense that you know you had you know roughly the same you know you didn't have that many characters um, relatively um, and so the, the characters that you were animated you know, you could stick with that style of animation. The sets weren't um, they weren't too many and too elaborate, so they were they are quite easy to animate when you compare it to what would be required for these two episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that that, that I, I think there is a desire for for Doctor Who fans to to purchase animations for all the missing adventures, and I do think there's a mm-hmm. desire for the animators and the people behind you know who were involved in for, for wanting to do it at the end of the day it comes down to money would they have enough time and money in order to do that and that's the question i think mm. at the moment um i think a lot of people are resided the fact that it may not actually happen i would argue is the animation even that good i mean the the amount of work that goes in is brilliant mm-hmm. um and i think it's a great visual aid yeah um but for me um it doesn't warrant wanting to get a complete set of animated stories. No, that's just, and I, yeah, because I, I don't want to come across as too negative because a lot of hard work goes into this, as, as you said. But the animation style's not one that I'm like a massive fan of. I think, I think no. yes, you're right. It provides uh, a visual aid. But I remember when the Ice Warriors, which is the Patrick Troughton story, which I think it's episodes two and three are missing from the archives, or three and four, something like that. So when it was released on VHS, they had um, they had this this way of providing the linking material, uh, and they made it look like if you if you watch the story, it would sort of make sense. They they made it look like this communicator had been dropped from the side of a cliff, and it was relaying um, this emergency broadcast, which provided the linking material bridging 
you know what would be covered in the missing episodes and it was done really really well uh, i liked it an awful lot and then i remember when the ice warriors was finally released on dvd um they animated those missing stories and i know this sounds re- i think a lot of people will probably go you blithering idiot but i actually preferred what they did on the vhs version than the than the animated I think they've said recently that with the power of the Daleks, um, the second time round they were able able to give a better depiction of the the performances um, and other certain aspects. So it just goes to show that it's never a, an exact representation of what it was originally mm-hmm. well, and uh, of course they can get it wrong there's not enough source material there mm-hmm. there's not all the storyboards um and there's not um there's not enough detailed accounts of what actually happened mm-hmm. oh yes and it, it can only be i mean in some instances that can be relatively close to you know because we've got screenshots available or we've got you know uh, camera scripts and, and things like that so but yes it, it can never be you know ig- exactly how it was broadcast it can only be you know uh, the, the best form of, of guess guesswork really um yeah but it's i think personally I, i'd rather just what listen to the soundtrack with kind of the telly snaps with, just with um just with the existing shots of an episode, mm, mm-hmm. like like how we had with Marco Polo, wasn't that on the um, the DVD? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. The, re- the reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm quite content with stuff like that. Yeah, because th- that was a half hour reconstruction. Um, d- I mean, you don't get the richness of the entire story when you do something like that, but you do get a good sense no, of no. the of the story, uh, and you. You do, yeah, you do get some sense of the story, and yeah, I thought uh, I thought that half hour reconstruction in the the beginning box set was um, was actually really good. If Crusade was animated, would you buy it? Yes, I probably would, uh, despite what I've just said, because I haven't actually bought any of the. I mean, I haven't bought any of the the other fully animated stories. I mean, I do have the Invasion. For example, which I think has episodes one and four that were animated. Yeah, um, yeah, I bought that when it came out. It was quite intriguing mm-hmm. to see what it was going to be like. And there's a few others like Tenth Planet and Reign of Terror, I think. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and poss- possibly a few others, but no. Um, generally, I just give them a bit of a miss. Yeah, but I think I think it's really if you how you feel about the stories. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of them I've got on CD anyway. Mm. So why, why fork out? Some of them are quite expensive, aren't they? On DVD when they come out, yeah, yeah, that's true. They they um they can be quite expensive, and I think the the question that people have now is, you know, th- there's clearly a desire to have all the um the Doctor Who stories released on Blu-ray. Um, mm-hmm. so when it comes to the box sets for the the Hartnell and the Troughton era, uh, one would suppose that the animated stories would be released alongside those. So do you want a double dip um, mm. if, if, if you are buying the box sets? But then, of course, mm. you'd sort of be aware that, well, if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're buying the animations now, when they first become available, you're providing them with money for future releases. Um, mm. And that may also include them going back to, um, to improve the animation a little bit. I don't know, but... Uh, yeah. I think whether the TV show um, is currently on the telly or if it's ever, if it's in a bit of a hiatus, I think commercially there'll always be a desire mm-hmm. for a complete for a complete um, collection, won't there, of all the lost stories? There was a little scene when um, the Doctor almost wished he was knighted too, and uh, <laughs> that that'll be the day, says Vicky. Yeah, that's true. And of course, he did become knighted in... Is it called Tooth and Claw? To- Tooth and Claw? Yes, yeah. yeah. Sir Doctor of TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I love that scene in Tooth and Claw. The residents of the house, or the servants of the house, um, 
the boy who turns into the werewolf, he's in a cage and the, they unveil him. Mm-hmm. And they all start screaming at the cage. But David Tennant points out in the commentary that they're just screaming at a naked boy because he's not a wolf yet. But either way, it's terrifying. Yes. <laughs> I haven't. I didn't. I've never. I don't think I've actually listened to the commentary. They don't come with many commentaries now, do they? I remember the the early few box sets, mm-hmm. maybe series one and two and three. They had even had in vision commentaries with the likes of Russell T. Davis, Julie Gardner. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah. I remember when yeah. um, the the five doctors was re-released on on dvd so it included the original transmitted version which had never been released on dvd i think this was back in 2008 or something um mm. maybe a little bit later and there there was the there was a there was an easter egg commentary which was uh provided by david tennant julie garden and it was one of the other producers i've forgotten his name now i'm not aware of this have you got the dvd yeah. Right. I've got yeah, I've got both the DVDs, yeah. Right. Um I can't remember on which disc it is. I think it I think it might be the one for the original version. Um it's on one of the menus and I'm sure if you click it on the Doctor Who logo, you know when it highlights green when there's an easter egg. Right. I think if you okay. if, yeah, I think yeah. if you click on that, um I think that's what'll bring the the commentary up. Right. I'll have a little hunt. I don't know which version I prefer. Of uh, the five doctors, I think we've had this discussion before because we've covered it in a podcast. Mm-hmm. I'd like to say it was the original, but I've become more accustomed to the special edition. But the special edition, it's a bit like watching the original Star Wars movie with all the extra CGI characters in. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It it feels a bit out of place. Some aspects of it, maybe. Well, maybe the time scoop. Oh yeah. It should look a. It should look a bit naff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. In terms of this, uh, in terms, of, I actually prefer the I, original. I would watch the special edition if I was to if I was to watch one. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'll happily watch the um, the uh, the special feature, but I think uh, the the special version of it. But um, I do think I prefer the the original. And in terms of that special effect of the time scoop, I think I prefer the original just because it does look a bit more ominous. Yes, and there's a, there's a special effect at the end where they all go into the same TARDIS. But leaving the respective TARDISes, and an image of the police box just kind of flies off the original. That is a, of ways. that is a bit naff. I've got to agree. I think yeah. that's that's a case where the, the the special version of it gets gets a bit. I remember the first time I watched the Five Doctors, uh, I've been seven or something like that. And I remember so when I, which was the original transmitted version because this was when it was on VHS. And I remember, I remember loving the fact that you got. You got the other TARDISes flying from the one. I thought that at the time, as a seven-year-old, I thought that was fantastic and one of the coolest things I'd ever seen. Watching it now, you go, "God, that looks shit." <laughs> Watching it through your fingers, <laughs> <laughs> behind the sofa, because it's a scary, bad special effect. Um, yeah. There was a few other different sequences. Um, when they enter the dark tower, is is there a wider scope of the? Um, of the tomb in the special edition. Sorry, is so, it more clo- so, say that again? It, is it more close-up shots of Rassilon's tomb in the original? Because I'm sure that there's quite a wide shot in the special edition that's not in the original. Yes, I think I think there was a wide shot and there was more establishing shots of of uh, the tomb of Rassilon and... Um, I mean, the special version is longer. And of course, there's that bit with um, Sarah Jane throwing the rock that you hate. <laughs> I don't want to hate it. I just think it's stupid. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't make me... I don't, no one can hate the Five Doctors. Um, it's just an absolute delight. Either version of it. Uh, but I, I, I think it's it's just stupid. But I don't hate it. It just makes me laugh. I don't know why it, always, it makes me chuckle as well. You know when Sarah get, gets caught initially by the time scoop when she's uh, standing next to the uh, the bus stop? Yeah, and then she gets caught, and just she she flings her handbag. I don't know why. Does she? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Just makes me laugh. But anyway, but um, this would be the moment, as I said before, we would have listeners' responses to uh, to what people thought of the crusade. But we've heard diddly squat. So all what I say no. is, um, 
um, give the give give the story a chance. Um, I, 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 I think you know if you're not familiar with it, go out and become familiar with it. Watch the episodes, listen to the the audio because I think it's an absolutely cracking story. Um, but just a reminder for social media information, we've obviously got the the, the website cloisterbellpodcast.com. You can get us on Instagram at cloister underscore bell or on Twitter at podcast bell. And we're also on Facebook as well. Um, we did run a poll on Twitter this evening, Liam. Yes, we did. Which have you seen? Have you seen the results yet? Uh, no, I haven't seen the results. Okay, which missing Doctor Who story would you most like to see the return of? And I picked, I think the three initial missing ones: Marco Polo, Reign of Terror, or Crusade. Mm-hmm. Um. Overwhelming majority, Marco Polo, 75%. Right, okay. And Reign of Terror creeping in at 13% ahead of um, the Crusades, 12%. So nobody wants it. <laughs> Who are these idiots? Who prefers the Reign of Terror over the Crusade? I mean, honestly. Jeez. Um, <laughs> I can kind of get why people would prefer Marco Polo because. It is a fantastic story, and it is the first the first time Doctor Who tries to to be epic. And f- from all accounts, it sounds like sounds like they succeeded. I would absolutely love um, Marco Polo to 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 be rediscovered. In fact, of all of all the complete missing stories, that's the one I want of of, of all the others. And I think with the Crusaders, like, well, at least we've got two of the four episodes we can watch. Um, yeah, so I, I, I can understand that um, that result. Um, yeah, because Marco Polo is, a, is is an absolutely fantastic story. And that would be hopefully brilliant. it'll turn up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got I've always had this theory in my head when I was younger. You know, um, it's probably not the case, but you know, if uh, if radio waves are being broadcast <laughs> out into space, <laughs> I used to think, could you not go far enough to beat to get ahead of them? And then all of a sudden, Doctor Who would hit you. <laughs> Sixties television. Yeah, funny enough that but they're not out there somewhere. They're bound to be. Funny enough that crossed my mind the other day because I was watching an episode of Futurama. I, f- oh, f- I think it's in series two. I can't quite remember. But there's this episode where um, Le from the uh, from the planet Obercon Percy uh, Percy I eight. He's watching a um, uh, single female lawyer. Um, which was this Earth television broadcast fr- from our time, but Fry in the Fry in the nineties stopped it broadcasting, and the radio waves were finally reaching um, Obercron Percy I eight, and so they're watching the episode because the radio waves have finally got to them, so they're able to watch all these old programs, and then it just cuts because the transmission. Oh, I, I remember this episode now. Yeah, and then so. So they then go invade Earth, so they can watch the final ever episode, and then and then Fry and Leela and everyone have to have to essentially remake the episode. Yes. Um, and then when I was watching that, I did think of going. I wonder if there are radio radio waves of old Doctor Who stories out there. Must be. <laughs> there must be. So anyway, uh, we found another potential way of discovering old classic Doctor Who. So if you're able to build a satellite and get it out there prompto. Uh, let us know if that's successful. Uh, oh yes, a satellite. I was thinking build a spaceship and go out there and watch it. But yeah, <laughs> satellite to relay it. <laughs> I'll trade it for three months just so I can be scoop anyway, whatever. But yes. so, so anyway, um, the crusade. Just as a, as a conclusion and a score. So, what are your overall thoughts and what would you what would you score it, Rob? Um, you pointed out some great dialogue and good characters. Um, I had a bit of a concern that there wasn't enough material given to the companions um, there's a few scenes where kind of Barbara is taking a, a step back in the scene where, where the other characters are talking um, do you think the characters were written just as well um, this far down the line yes actually and to be honest uh, I now because at this point Susan has left the series and we have Vicky who's the first new companion of of the show. And um, I actually prefer her to Susan. And that isn't um, 
That isn't because of... I mean, Maureen O'Brien's a brilliant actress, and I'm not saying that Carol Ann Ford wasn't. It was more to do with the way that the character was, the characters were written and interacted. Because it's quite funny. So even though we're introduced to the show in An Unearthly Child through Susan, and she's, you know, this very well-written character, I feel that as the series progressed, um, you know, the, the Doctor was written very well, as was Barbara and Ian, but, but Susan suffered an awful lot. Mm-hmm. And didn't become this this interesting, you know, was no longer the interesting character that she was when we were first introduced to her. Um, and actually, because you mentioned the Reign of Terror before, it's a good story. But one of the things that really bugs the hell out of hell of, hell out of me with that story is actually Susan um, and how she's written. You know, because at this point, they you know they've encountered Daleks and all sorts of horrors. And they managed to cope with an awful lot. And uh, Barbara and Susan are in prison waiting to be guillotined. They've got to escape, otherwise they're going to get their heads lopped off. But they can't escape, because Susan ends up screaming ahead over uh, a couple of rats. And that prevents their escape. Now, don't get me wrong, rats are creepy. And, you know, I don't like them either. But if it's a case of, we've got to leave this place, or we're getting our heads lopped off... Uh, but we can't be, you know, but anyway, I think you get the point. It's just absolutely mm-hmm. frustrating. Whereas at this point, so Susan has left uh, and Vicky comes in, who I just think is a, a really nice character in general, played very well by Maureen, o, Maureen o, uh, Brian. But um, actually, the relationship between her and the, because she basically becomes a surrogate granddaughter, really. And the way mm-hmm. that the characters are written and how they relate to one another. And... Um, and how William Hartnell performs alongside her, I think, is a lot stronger than what had actually gone on when Susan was, it, you know, by the time she left. I feel we had a we had a better origin with her because you knew not only did we know who she was within the stories that were being told, we knew where she came from. Mm-hmm. She had more of a tangible kind of origin story as opposed to Susan, who was just kind of um, this mysterious character. Along with the Doctor, yeah, that's true. I mean, I never considered that before. Maybe that was maybe that was a bit individual because if you've got two, if you've got half of the main characters who are, you know, who are mysterious, um, mm-hmm. maybe that maybe that does po- pose problems. But um, uh, yeah, that's that's actually a very good point. Whereas with Susan, yeah, for, for, whereas with Vicky, yeah, from the from the off, you know, we can relate to her. So. There's only one character who is mysterious mm. and unknowable, yeah. which is the Doctor, and then the other three, uh, yeah, the other three are ones who we can relate to. So yeah, yeah, we did we did point out on the podcast last week when we were talking about the Aztecs that even though Susan did get a good story in that um, in that serial because all the characters kind of were off dealing with their own problems, but Susan had um, the smallest part of the narrative. It, it almost sidelined um, but she was going through some interesting stuff but that's just another example that um, she maybe wasn't um, written to her full potential yeah that's true but then it, it's, it's sort of because I would say with the crusade I, I think if the, I think in this occasion it's Ian who's kind of sidelined really because even though he has this important task so narratively he's important but in terms of screen time we don't get an awful lot of him. You know, the focus is on Barbara, obviously, because she's the one who's kidnapped. And then the focus is also on the Doctor and, and Vicky and their relationship mm. between Joanna and, and King Richard. And Ian's just, you know, either he's in the desert or he's in Saladin's camp or he appears at the end. Um, I mean, he doesn't feel too shortchanged because he is important to the narrative, but in terms of screen time, he's the one who is given the less, I would say. So with regards to a score, I don't think... I could possibly give it a fair score, um, given that I haven't seen the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I think I enjoy the Aztecs more still, but I do agree with you about the writing in there, the brilliant scenes with the characters in this. So I think I'm going to go with um, a nine out of ten. Oh, fantastic! No, I can I can't uh, quite understand. Uh, I mean, th- you know, a lot of people do uh, prefer the Aztecs. Uh, in general, to other William Hartnell stories, not just in terms of the Crusade, uh, and it is a very, very good story. 
Um, but I prefer the Crusade. I mean, it's it, it's one of those perverse things. It's like, for God's sake, are you trying to be a smartass by picking a story we can't completely watch? Frick's sake. <laughs> um, but it's I can't help it. I do genuinely love this story. I think it's a good story. I think it's told very well. Um, and I'm just... I know I, uh, I've mentioned it quite a few times, but I am really, really impressed with the dialogue. And yeah. for the episodes that we, we can watch, which is The Lion and The Wheel of Fortune, so episodes one and three respectively, um, you know, th- they're just fantastic television. Um, and it, it's one of those frustrating things. It's a shame that we can't watch the full thing, but for me that doesn't detract from what nonetheless remains a very, very good story. Um, yeah. I really, really love it. Uh, yeah, uh, and in terms of a score, I've given. Uh, I haven't said that though. In terms of a score, I've given it exactly the same as you. Nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. Perfect. But if we do look at any more missing stories, I think I'll try and get a bit. Um, I'll give them a couple of watches or a couple of listens rather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do a bit more research because um, there's probably quite a lot to learn. And it, it, it's it's one of those. I remember years ago that uh, the BBC had a 1960s um, season and there was one night they they showed episode one of The Web of Fear and at that point it was the, 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 the only remaining episode of that story and I remember watching it and it was the first time I ever watched it. I think this was 2004 if I remember rightly and mm. it's a fantastic episode and I remember when it ended knowing at that point that we would never, ever, ever see the rest of that story. Uh, it was just, oh, it was just absolutely frustrating. And lo and behold, now, in 2020, apart from episode three, we, we've we got the rest of the Web of Fear. It's, um, mm. it's a miracle, really. I would absolutely love if, at some point in the future, somehow, I... Sev- I sen- I doubt any other episodes of, of Doctor Who will ever be discovered, but you know we always say that, and then a few years pass and somehow we're surprised. Um, so hopefully that will be the case. I would absolutely love if Marco Polo was discovered against all odds, but if episodes two and four of the Crusade were discovered, so I can, well, we can all, um, you know, completely watch this story again. Um, Everyone can enjoy it. I think it would. I think people would perhaps reevaluate it as well, because funny enough, when the enemy of the world prior to that, prior to that, its rediscovery, we only had episode three, and when Doctor Who magazine and Doctor Who websites came to ranking Doctor Who stories, the the, the enemy of the world wasn't really rated particularly highly. But since its discovery and the fact that we can watch it all, mm. it's had a massive reevaluation, and people seem to love it, uh, and it's it's ranked a lot higher. Um, the complete opposite happened with Tomb of the Cybermen, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it did sort of, yeah, because like for many, yeah, that's true actually. Because for many years, people go, "Oh, it's a classic, it's fantastic," and then people were able to watch it going, oh, "It's not all that, is it?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, um, but I would, I would love it if if people start giving a toss about this story because I do really love it. <laughs> Hopefully, if anything, it'd be quite nice if if my ramblings on it have piqued some people's interest. Go and check it out. Yeah, check it out now. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, that's going to say thank you very much for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and if you haven't watched the Crusade, um, we hope you piqued your interest. If you ha- if if you if you're familiar with it, um, do still get in contact with us because I I would be interested to know your thoughts um, on whether you. Uh, you rate the story particularly or, or not yeah um, well this con- this concludes our fortnight of first after stories yes so now we're ditching Hartnell uh, and we're moving on to Trout I think I'd provisionally said Tomb of the Cybermen mm-hmm. shall I not reveal what you said no, no, we'll 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 uh, we'll keep the suspense for what my favourite Trout and story is a little bit uh, for a little <laughs> longer but um So, uh, until next time, where uh, Rob and I will be discussing Tomb of the Cybermen, take care and hope to hear from you.